people have told me when they stepped on this campus, and even myself, when I first stepped on this campus, you just feel this presence, you feel this, this acceptance. It's really like a family. Like, we're definitely a big family here at North Point. We can have a campus that creates an environment for spiritual growth, for intensity in worship. It's about allowing individuals to be transformed in their character, in their service, in their leadership. I knew immediately that this was a place that I needed to be. Hey everybody, this is Tim Enloe. I'm really excited about Pentecost 2020. Coming up here the end of May, we celebrate the day of Pentecost. That's the feast where God first poured out the Holy Spirit upon his church after Jesus ascended to heaven. You can read about it in Acts chapter two. And it's my privilege to spend some time teaching by way of video uh, our church and then spending a few moments in prayer afterwards where we can experience and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Don't miss it, I can't wait to see you. Sing 
this together. Your presence is in open door. We want you more like never before. Your presence is in open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Welcome you back to another Sunday celebration service. I want you to know that I am so grateful that you chose to be here with us today. Today I'm going to begin a two-part series um, called The Dream is Dead, But Hope is Still Alive. Uh, today's title is You Are the Man. <laughs> now, don't worry, this is a message for the ladies as well. Uh, the title comes from the prophet Nathan as he speaks to King David. We're going to begin by reading out of 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 9. Why don't you follow me today? And then we're going to open up with a word of prayer. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel. It is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and you have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Hey, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you that your word is alive and powerful. Lord, your word is sharp. It can cut us deep, but it can also penetrate our soul. Lord, in a way that we're changed and renewed and transformed. God, I pray for everyone that is listening today. God, I pray that you put a deposit into their hearts that brings about fruit that will last and fruit that will remain. That through your word, we come into the knowledge of Christ in this moment. God, for a moment, some of our dreams and aspirations may seem like they're dead. But hope is still alive and can still be found in you. We thank you for your word. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen and amen. Immediately when I read this story, a couple of things jumped out to me and I, I thought it was interesting. I wanted to share it with you. I find it, I find it amazing how quick David was to jump to judgment. I find it amazing how quick you and I can recognize another person's flaws or, or shortcomings or failures. Or we can recognize weakness. I don't know if it's just part of our design. I always find it astounding, especially in musician circles how quickly somebody can make a judgment if you ever hear a musician and they make a mistake and all of a sudden they can just drop down in rankings in your mind I, that's in music circles how about you maybe in sports circles maybe you make a decision really quickly um, that maybe someone's not talented enough or capable enough um, what about in real estate circles maybe someone can't hit a quota and all of a sudden you're like I don't want that person on my team I don't know carpentry computer gaming it's amazing how fast we can pass judgment on another person. David quickly calls out the character in the story as having a lack of compassion, which I find it almost comedic. Uh, they used to sing songs about David. Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his tens of thousands. I wonder if David's victims uh, considered David as being someone with a lack of compassion. I mean, David was a pretty rough guy. 
And, and I just wanted to take this moment to encourage you to slow down. Be very careful and cautious. Make sure you have all the facts and that you don't follow every breadcrumb of information or news and immediately take a position. I, I would encourage you to do the best you can to dig and, and, and come up with a wealth of information before you strongly hold a position or make a judgment. And that person that you, you make a judgment about, you might not have all the details. I mean, I personally, I've been a victim countless times of fast judgments um, without all the facts coming into play. It's, it's, it's impossible to know the motivation of a heart. Um, and so I would encourage you, slow down. I mean, have you experienced that? Have you been on the other side of the pendulum where someone has made a, 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 a brash judgment or, or a, a stated something about you that's been incorrect? David was quick to make a judgment. And as we're going to see, uh, a lot of events unfold. But before we get into all that, we got a couple of characters we're talking about here. we got Uriah the Hittite, we've got Nathan, and we've got David. Who, who is Nathan? Nathan was a prophet. In these days, it was very common for, for kings to have advisors. And among those were spiritualists. Um, so within this culture, these were people that heard from God. They were prophets. In the Old Testament, they called them seers. And then David was the second king of Israel. Now, he's a great king, but he was a man with great flaws as well. So before Nathan the prophet arrives in this story in chapter 12, a huge drama has unfolded and it really began in chapter 11. Just a couple of highlights about this. So first of all, David spies another man's wife. And uh, as a king, he beckons to her. She comes into his quarters and he commits adultery. And then David then discovers that this man's wife is pregnant. So he tries to manipulate the situation. And when that doesn't work, David gets frustrated that he can't circumvent this. So he arranges for Bathsheba's husband, who is Uriah, to be killed by holding a position uh, in war that ultimately leads to his death. So this major drama becomes a cornerstone for a lot of Israel's rich history. And it's one that sets up an encounter with Jesus. And I, I mean, before I dive too deep in this, um, I mean, literally, this creates the opportunity and the conclusion, a consequence that leads to Jesus. Literally, David's son, Nathan, his third son, is a relative of Mary. His other son, Solomon, is a relative of Joseph. So literally, this unfolds and leads into the genealogy of Jesus. It's amazing how everything points back to Christ. So, Quick takeaway on that, man, is that your current drama, your current situation, your current set of circumstances is not your final destination. So I want to, oh, if I could just encourage you right now, if I could put my hand on your shoulder and just tell you, keep going, keep pushing, keep pressing. I know times look tough right now. I know circumstances, they, they look like I don't, uh, just they look questionable and, and, and we don't know what the conclusion is, but I know that right now is not your conclusion. I know with all the uncertainty that surrounds us, I know with all the difficulty and trauma that is around us right now, I wanna encourage you to keep moving forward. Keep going, those who persevere and don't faint not will, will, will see a prize. We'll see a prize, keep going, keep going. Praise God. So when we read 2 Samuel, there's two major takeaways that I, I pray are deposited in your heart today, all right? This is powerful, so don't miss it. Number one, the price we pay for sin is always far greater than the pleasure we incur. Ah, oh, hear me. The price that we pay for sin is always greater than the pleasure we incur. That's the first one. As we're going to soon see, moments of pleasure for David led to decades and generations of heartache. The second thing is, God is merciful. You need to say that right now. God is merciful. In fact, while we see judgment getting played out here, the judgment that David actually incurred was a result of his swift judgment and his swift presumption. And we see presumption causing a lot of problem in, in scripture. Really, David is a successor to a man who was very presumptuous. King Saul, the first king of Israel, became presumptuous took it upon himself to act a certain way and in doing so lost the kingdom. And, and so David and his presumption and his quick judgment 
he's incurred judgment on himself. Nathan, in wisdom, presents a parable to King David. That's how this began, this parable. Now, the reason why he presents a parable, and it's very wise that he did this, is Jesus often taught in parables, and that was a way to, to level the ground and present a story that everybody could relate to and connect to, but it brings them all to the same conclusion. Because in these days, you couldn't just walk into the king's uh, chamber and just begin speaking. That could have cost Nathan his life, even with a man like David. So in wisdom, he's able to navigate King David to a conclusion that helps David recognize his own sin. So here's how the story goes. As I just read, you have two men, one rich, one poor. Uh, one had many sheep, one only had one. The man with the single sheep deeply loved his little lamb. <laughs> a sojourner passes through, and as customary, a meal is prepared for the guest. When the rich man, rather than taking one of his many sheep, he seizes the poor man's lamb. David responds intently and angrily. The man who has done this must pay with his life and pay restitution for full. And I want you to consider a few things before we really get into this message. Because this parable is far more than just a cute little anecdotal story of, with a gotcha ending. This is a powerful, this is a powerful parable. In, in the culture, David would have recognized this. Uh, he would have recognized the intensity of this. And this is why it spurred him on to such great anger. Number one, the rich man used the situation to make himself look good. In this parable, the rich man took something that didn't belong to him and it made him look good. It made him feel good. The rich man would have received honor and would have been dignified for providing a guest uh, this meal, it would have placed him in a place of honor, placed him on a pedestal. It would have been a visual token. It would have caused others to esteem him, but it would have cost the rich man nothing. The integrity of service begins when it costs you something. David understood this. In 1 Chronicles 21, 24, earlier in David's reign, God's judgment is, is being enacted and, and in order to turn God's judgment, David is gonna make an offering to the Lord. So somebody willingly turns over this threshing floor to King David and David says, I'm gonna purchase this from you. I will not offer to the Lord something that does not cost me. The whole point of an offering is the price associated. We cannot purchase God's favor or good pleasure. Uh, we can present what costs to God. I wonder if you're willing to take your service and your sacrifice to the point of cost. Is there things in your life that you've offered to the Lord that costs you? We often associate that financially, but God wants more than your money. God wants everything. He wants all of who you are. He wants every decision that you make to pass through him through prayer. He wants every resource that you have. He wants every bit of talent that you have to be laid on an altar for his pleasure in order to use it to advance his cause, his message, and his gospel. I wonder if you're willing to take your service and commitment in Christ to the point of sacrifices so many have. I'm reminded that it's one thing to be associated with one person's sacrifice or a church or an institution that does great things, but I don't wanna hide behind that. Oh, that God would call us to the forefront as well. That God would call you to the forefront as well. Some of us are called to the forefront as parents. Some of us are called to the forefront as spouses. Some of us are called to the forefront as teachers. Some of us are called to the forefront by just being an upright citizen in our community. But nonetheless, God has called you to stand on the forefront. And in that, it may cost you. It may cost you reputation. It may cost you a few jeers, a few chuckles because you're following Christ. Others, it may cost far more. Nonetheless, it's gonna cost. God finds pleasure in sacrifices that cost. The second aspect is the poor man and the lamb. I, don't pass by that so quickly. We don't read, nor is there any inkling that the poor man is combated or fought off anything to keep this lamb, despite his deep love and affection 
for his lamb. Despite the price, this poor man still gave up what he had because he wanted to provide for the traveler. Now in Jewish culture, this would have been very common and it would have been wildly important and be considered very righteous. It would have been a great dishonor to do otherwise. Many of the patriarchs that you read in the Bible, they demonstrated great hospitality. Well, I used to work for the United Methodist Conference and it was a phrase I heard thrown around uh, quite often. It was gratuitous hospitality. I love that. I believe we are called to practice gratuitous hospitality. Do you remember Abraham, the book of Genesis, Father Abraham? He provided great hospitality to three strangers, three sojourners, turned out to be angels. This custom is repeated over and over in scripture. This poor man sat by silently, knowing of his sacrifice, a sacrifice that nobody else would have known. And I wanna pause here, because many of you right now are behind the scenes, you guys are fighting behind the scenes. So many of you right now are making great sacrifices. There are things happening that no one will ever know about. You're toiling through the night, you're losing sleep, you're working right now. We have many volunteers. We have many people doing things that no one may never recognize or ever truly know. So I want to say this carefully. God knows. I said I want to say that carefully because me saying that might not bring you immediate comfort. But you've got to comfort yourself with the knowledge that God sees you. God sees the integrity. And God sees the work. And honoring God in difficult times is costly, but it will yield the fruit of righteousness. Can I tell you, keep going. Keep honoring the Lord. Well, then the last parallel that I really saw in this narrative is uh, it's not strange that Nathan would have used lambs in his illustration. Uh, the Jewish people were uh, a lot of sh shepherds. That was very common. But you can't help but recognize the parallels between this lamb and the lamb of God. The one precious lamb that was slain for your sins and for mine. And so while the world is rich, like the rich man in this story, the world is engulfed in sin. <laughs> the world is rich in sin. And the truth is, the great wealth was found in the great sacrifice. Let me say that one time, okay? The great wealth was really found in the great sacrifice. So as we dig into this, I wanna recognize, let me just blow over it really quickly again. Number one, be slow to judge. David would incur a fourfold judgment uh, that he actually pronounced. He experienced the death of his son uh, with Bathsheba, the death of his other son Amnon, the death of his son Absalom, and then the death of his son Adonijah, which fell by the hand of his other son Solomon. Be slow to judge. The second is uh, the sacrifice, what costs, regardless of esteem or honor. Sacrifice what's gonna cost you. And then lastly, greatness is not in what you can acquire, it's found in what you can sacrifice. It doesn't mean it matter if it appears to be small, bring it to the Lord. All right, so for the remainder of today's message, I wanna camp out really on verse nine. David despised the word of the Lord. Here's what it says. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and you've killed him with the sword of his sons Amnon. What was the word of the Lord and how did David actually despise it? I mean, after all, David killed lots of people, but it wasn't until this happened that we see a manifestation of God's judgment. How did he despise the word of the Lord? Well, despise, it means treat it with contempt, disregard, ignore, remain unaffected by it. We can despise God's word in two particular ways, right? Either blatant disregard or impassive disregard. Blatantly or causing it to be an afterthought. And David did both of these things when he put what he wanted before God's command. We're often guilty of this in so many different ways. I remember the time when I was uh, maybe probably in third grade, I think my brother was in fifth grade. My mother would work in school as a teacher's assistant and then around two o'clock, she would cruise over to the other side of town in Miami and uh, worked at an after-school care program. 
This was the 80s. So afterwards, me and my brother, we'd hold hands and we'd walk a couple of miles. We did this several times a week. And then we would stay in the after school care program with my mother until about five or six, then we would go home. And I remember this set of triplets, but the two brothers in particular, it was two brothers and a sister. And uh, we'll just call them the Thompson twins because that sounds like a really good 80s villain name. So, but I remember this one particular time that we're playing in the playground. You guys remember those big ceramic tubes that are probably illegal to put on playgrounds nowadays? Uh, you know, everybody broke an arm on one of those things. And um, I remember that the two brothers were in the tube and I came toddling along. I was like, hey guys, what are you doing? And they said, come here, come here. They called me into the tube and I looked on the wall and they were writing all of these swear words on the inside of this tube. And I'll never forget that one of the brothers literally grabbed my hand, put the pen in my hand with the chalk and said, go ahead, go ahead, write a word. And I was like, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. Like, that's bad. And uh, I don't know what happened, but peer pressure. And I started writing my first bad word. I remember writing it. What I didn't notice was one of the brothers slipped out of the tube and got my mom. <laughs> and as I get ready to finish this word, I remember just that long Puerto Rican arm snatching me out of that tube. And man, did she spare not the rod in that moment. <laughs> but I remember in that moment, the awareness, but the disregard. It was as if I contemptuously responded to those things that uh, that my mother had taught me. Boy, did I learn my lesson. Now the truth is, maybe you've had an instance like that. But the problem wasn't the fact that I was doing something wrong. The problem was in the great pleasure I derived in doing what was wrong. In the thing that you know you ought not be doing in the first place. Really, that's where the contempt takes place. Don't you know? that sin is pleasurable for just a moment. But when mama catches you, <laughs> when the law catches up to you, and when God's righteous standard catches up to us, and that is where we find treating God with contempt. This is where we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can come into your life and change your taste and your preference because the reality is many of us walk away with a great sense of pleasure in sin but it's only for a season. That's why David cried out in Psalms 51.10, create me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. And what I like about that is a better translation is actually gonna be found in the NIV. Uh, it's more close to the original language. Is give me a steadfast spirit. That's more accurate, because I'm more interested in being firm in my position than being right in my position. I'm more concerned with being firm in my position than being right in my position. Because a lot of times what I define to be right in the moment is not right in the long run. Don't you know that when I'm in sin, it feels right. But what I need to be is firm and founded on the rock. I can't be right until I am firm in what is actually right. <laughs> And that is where God wants to bring us. He wants to bring us to a place of true righteousness. He wants to bring us to a place where we are once despising and disregarding righteousness to a place of standing firm in righteousness. So God can flip our positions easily. He can take us from a place of flaky stances to firm footing. He can take me from the thing that I thought once brought me pleasure and it brought me out of unrighteousness to bringing me into a place of right standing and despising the sin that once brought me security. God wants to establish you firmly. David despised the word of the Lord. David stepped into shaky territory. God wants to bring you into a place of security. The second thing is the word of the Lord. What was the word of the Lord? He despised it, but what was the word of the Lord? Well, specifically, we find that out in Exodus 20, 13, and 14. Literally, God's word, don't murder, don't commit adultery. God has set laws and precepts that you and I must abide by. 
Do not think because your position or achievements, promises that God has made you that you can get by in sin. You and I must not despise the word of the Lord. God doesn't wink at sin. Listen to me. Many of us, we go into church and we hear what God is speaking to us, but then come nightfall, we're by ourselves in front of the computer, or we've got that boyfriend and girlfriend and we've taken things in a direction or too far where God has told us not to go clearly in his word. Many of us are holding on to addictions and patterns and habits that God has clearly told us in his word that we ought not to be lining our lives up with, Yet we believe that, well, God loves me and God has this promise for me. So God is just going to be okay with it. I want you to know God is never okay with sin. He wants to bring you out of sin. You're going to have to want to give it up. You're going to have to want to bring it to him in repentance and say, Lord, there is this junk in my life and I know it doesn't please you. And I'm only fooling myself to make me think that you're winking at it or you're just not going to just passively look past it. David didn't get away with it, and you and I will not get away with it. Bring it to the Lord. I want to encourage you. Bring it to the Lord. He loves you. If you feel like you can't come to the Lord, I want you to know that's a lie from the enemy. You can come to the Lord just as you are. David despised the word of the Lord. Let us not fall into that same mistake. David betrayed and murdered Uriah the Hittite. Uriah could have been one of David's close friends or confidants. He was a trusted official. We see that when Uriah comes in on vacation, that David invites him in. There's, there's a friendly connection there. Yet David murdered him. The words that you use there, you slayed him with a sword. This is a powerful phrasing without diving into the ethical and cultural aspects of war and all of that. Understand that this act was a, was a vicious affront, a meditated murder, David is held responsible, though David did not literally do the slaying. In God's eyes, David literally did the slaying. Now, how can we possibly derive a hopeful message from such a tragic story and illustration? I'm going to look at this from two sides. Okay, number one, God sees and knows every injustice. I want you to know in this season that, that we're curious uh, what is fact? What is fiction? What is injustice? What's actually happening? Maybe some of you have have those questions circling in your mind, or maybe you've experienced your own personal injustice, mistreatment. God sees every injustice. God will hold people accountable. Those who have hurt you, those who have caused injustice in the land, those who have created unjust circumstances that many of us have been victimized by. These things, they may play out causing us hurt, harm, and suffering, but I want you to take comfort in knowing that God knows and God will deal with the root of it. You can take hope today knowing that those things that have been done to you in your life cause you great hurt. They will be rectified. You've got to hold on. Don't give up on the Lord. Hang in there. Continue to move. I know that some of the injustices some of the people that have taken advantage of some of you, some of the hurt, some of the crimes, some of the deep, dark wrongdoings that have caused you great mental and emotional conflict and turmoil. I want you to know that we serve a God that sees all things. God didn't do those things to you. God will justify and rectify the situation. So I want to encourage you, do not take up the sword and try to bring justice God wants to handle it. Oh, I know that I can't say that lightly. I personally have been impacted. Close people next to me have, have suffered at the hands of great injustice, but I want you to know that God sees all. Now on the flip side, if you are the perpetrator, if you are the one who has caused great heart, hurt and pain and suffering, I want you to know today that there's a greater mercy and grace available to you. What made King David so great? Michelangelo carved the statue of him. We've heard great stories of David versus Goliath. But I want you to know it's none of those things that made David great. What made David great is David was great at repenting. When Nathan confronts David, David doesn't deny it. And David doesn't make excuses. He owns his sin. Psalms 51.4, he pens this. 
Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. What are we going to close with in this part one of this message? As, as I've said, number one, be slow to judge. I, I bet many of you would be less upset if you brought the walls of judgment down in your life and begin to look to God as the judge. Sacrifice what costs, regardless of esteem and honor. I want to tell you that you're working from home or you're working remotely and, and systems and structures are, are misaligned right now, but keep going with integrity. Keep going with excellence. Keep honoring the Lord. Don't faint. Don't quit. Don't give up. Greatness is not in what you can acquire. It's found in what you can sacrifice. The second thing I want to, I want to hone in on as we get ready to pray is we need a preference shift. We need a perspective or a paradigm shift. Despising God's command can become embracing his commands. Despising God's command can become embracing his commands. Oh, if you would embrace God's command, if David would have just held on to God's commands, he never would have found himself in this situation. He never would have found himself in this awful situation. And maybe some of us have found ourselves in awful situations. I, I want to be transparent for a moment. There's many times when I reflect on my life, I look back on the things I should not have done and the pain that those things caused. And I think to myself, oh, I should not have done those things. If I would have just held on to God's commands, if I would have just honored the Lord. But we serve a good God. We serve a good God that can take us from a point of momentary failure and flaw to a place of success and blessing. And he can take us to a place of his pleasure and favor. And then lastly is, I want you to know that God will bring justice so you do not have to. It doesn't mean we don't fight for injustice and equality. It doesn't mean that we don't take up certain measures and stand for things. But you need to know that at the end of the day, the battle belongs to the Lord. Often in war, in God's army, we simply need to stand. I want to tell you, no matter what's been done to you, keep standing, keep standing, keep trusting you. I would invite you right now to pray with me David's prayer. Pray, God, there are areas in my life, no matter how I sugarcoat it, it is sin against you. I'm a man or I'm a woman who has sinned. Forgive my harsh criticisms and judgments. I want to be a person of great sacrifice for your glory and your glory alone. Shift my perspective. When we hear those words, you are the man, I can't help but think how often I've been that man. You are the woman. Oh, that statement isn't made to point a finger at you and tell you God's unhappy with you. But that statement is, is made to help us recognize that you and I are not immune to the shortcomings. That you and I are not immune from that righteous standard that God has from falling short of it. But even greater, that there are those around us that our lives continually touch that fall short of God's righteous standard. And so, and as much as I want to pray for you, would you consider praying for another person? Is there anyone that you can think of right now that we're not passing judgment, but we can look and we can see there are those that are hurting, that are crippled by sin, that are in bondage to sin, that are in bondage to addiction, that are in broken marriages, that are in broken relationships, or that are suffering from hurt on the inside, that they are the man or the woman that are living now in a consequence from poor decisions and not holding on to the righteousness of God. We may not know all the answers. We may not know, know all the reasons. And you know, there are those people that are dealing with circumstances not of their own making. And they did nothing wrong. All the more reason to pray for them. Would you join me in prayer right now? Wherever you are. Wherever you are right now. Join me in prayer right now. Father, we ask you that you would bring justice. God, there are those of us that are dealing right now with unforgiveness in our hearts and we, we want to see justice because something has been done to us. Lord, that we've been victimized in some way. Lord, help us right now to recognize that the battle belongs to you and that the greatest fight we can take is standing firm and letting you fight for us, fighting ourselves from acting out in the places that you alone have the authority to act out. God, I pray that you would help me to recognize the areas in my life 
Lord, that falls short from your righteous standard, from your glorious standard. Lord, I ask you that you would forgive me of my harsh criticisms and judgments. God, I pray that you would make us a people of great sacrifice for your glory and your glory alone, even if it's like the one giving up the little lamb, the one thing that's precious. God, that we would recognize the more precious it is to us, the greater sacrifice it is. God, and I lastly would ask that you would shift perspectives, God, that we wouldn't show contempt for your word. Lord, there are things that are a part of this Christian walk that are difficult and are very challenging, God. And some of us can respond to that with contempt in our hearts. Lord, that we're very passive about it. But God, today we say we want to line up with what your word commands us to do. We want to line up with the things you've called us to do. We want to be the people that you've called us to be. We want to be a holy, righteous group of people. Lord, not better than anybody else. Else, but Lord, people that have been made clean and holy by the blood of Jesus. I pray for anyone right now that feels like I'm not qualified. Feels like I've done too much sin. Feels like I've been the perpetrator. Feels like that they've fallen so short that God, you wouldn't want anything to do with them. But today, you, you want to tell them that you do. You love them. You died for them today, just as they are, wherever they are in the spectrum, on the walk. Lord, you love them. You died for them. You can rectify all situations right now in their life. The first step is giving the life and renewing that commitment to you, King Jesus. So would you join me right now? I want to pray for you. If you want to commit your life or recommit your life to Christ, there's a box that's going to pop up. It says, uh, need prayer or I, I want to commit my life to Jesus. You can do that right now. And, and, and we're going to pray with you personally. There'll be someone on the other side that will, will join you in prayer. Let, let, let's pray about that. Father, in Jesus' name, I recommit my life. Or I commit my life for the first time to you. I want to live after you. I want to do and be all that you've called me to do in me. Forgive my sin. Forgive me, God, for not abiding by your, your rule. Forgive me for, for knowing certain things, but falling away from it, God. Disregarding it. Today, we want to make that right. We want to walk in your favor. We want to walk in your good pleasure. And Lord, I want my life to bring you glory. Make me a child of God today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. I want to thank you for joining me today. I would encourage you to, to breeze through the notes um, and review the passages. Go ahead and read 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. Let the Lord speak to you. This is a powerful teaching. And I want you to know that God has a good plan for you. That God wants to bring you in a place of relationship and fellowship. He can do that. If you need any prayer, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We love you. God bless you. Have an incredible week.